The players helped sweep the rum. Eight. They were champions of England, testing their talents abroad. But the flight home was turned treacherous by snow. The players helped sweep the runway to give the aircraft a fighting chance. It was January 17th, 1957, and Manchester United made it home from Bilbao. Just over a year later, in Munich, there was snow on the runway again. This time, the plane did not come home. One cold and bad Thursday in Munich, Germany. Come 6th of February, 50 years on, it's going to be a, quite an emotional day around about this place, felt by everyone. What a great loss. What a great loss to English football. Why did I take the club into Europe? Why would you go on the plane? The flowers of Manchester. In the decade after the Second World War, Matt Busby had founded a footballing dynasty. His title-winning side of 1956 had an average age of 22 and played pass and move football that took their appeal beyond Old Trafford and Manchester. Within two years, it would all be taken away. It was such a tragedy because we were so good. We were such a good team. Bobby Charlton was a reserve. Bobby Charlton, one of the best players ever in the world. At 19, filled in for Billy Whelan, Dennis Violet and Tommy Taylor. The boys lived Dean Diggs locally, they, they walked to Old Trafford to train. Uh, those that went on the bus jumped on the bus at the corner with the other fans. They went in the same newsagent shop to buy the sweets and tobacco. Just ordinary lads coming from ordinary backgrounds. What went on to be, I think, probably one of the greatest club sides this world's ever seen. For the Busby Babes, style was king. Trends were set by David Pegg and Eddie Coleman off the pitch. On it, two young men in particular stood out. I've seen all the great centre forwards from Tommy Lawton, saw Tommy Lawton, I've seen them all right down to Rooney and Michael Owen, and I tell them, I said, you couldn't lace Tommy Taylor's boots. Duncan Edwards was a total powerhouse of a player. I can remember one particular game, I went to Blackpool, and United were upfield, and Blackpool broke away. And one of the Blackpool players lobbed the ball over Harry Gregg as he came out beyond the edge of the penalty area and Duncan Edwards had got back and tore past everybody. And I've got a photograph in his book of him clearing the ball off the line. They just enjoyed playing football, um, whether it be playing football in, with the kids in the village where we lived or whether it be playing football in Europe. Europe was territory the Football League didn't want the babes to enter. But Busby wouldn't be bullied. The first campaign brought a semi-final defeat to the great Real Madrid. But a second successive league title made the European dream a reality again. We went into Europe against the wishes of, of the Football League, uh, but Mad Busby said, no, we're going into it because we think this is the future. If you want to be the best, you have to play against the best. United's rivals couldn't get near them. The supporters often could. And I bought Matt Busby's book, My Story, and then I decided, a week before Munich, that I'd make an early start and get down to Old Trafford and see if I could get Matt Busby's autograph in the book. And I got down there about 10 to 9, and he turned up within a few minutes. Lovely big camel overcoat. I said, uh, Mr Busby, would you very kindly sign your autograph for me? Oh, he said, certainly, young man. And I was about to turn away. I saw Bill Inglis, the, one of the assistant trainers. I said, oh, Bill, is there any chance of getting an autograph or two if any of the players are in? He said, I think you're in luck. Come with me. So I followed him in, and there was a great crowd of them having cups of tea and talking. So I popped myself down at the end and found myself sitting next to Duncan Edwards. He said, uh, what's your name? I said, Graham. He said, give us your pen. 
and disappeared with my book. I gave him my Parker pen, should have kept the pen, and uh, Duncan went round with the book. A few minutes, came back and said, there we are. Well, I was absolutely agog. And I just sat in the car when I got a bit further away. And I couldn't believe all those autographs. Not just the team, but Busby's book, autographed by him and all the players. It, I think it must be a one-off. It must be. Graham Masters wished his heroes luck for their next two games. That weekend saw a typically entertaining 5-4 win at Arsenal. In Belgrade, they took a 2-1 lead into the game with Red Star. The side shared six goals. Manchester United had reached the European Cup semi-final. Little Johnny Berry. His words were exactly this. We're all going to get friggin' killed here. And Liam Whelan sitting in the aisle seat said, well, if it happens, I'm ready. And then all it was was just battering and bang, daylight and darkness and sparks. But there was no, no shouts or cries of any kind, just a terrible tearing and rend of metal. I never seen a bomb, I don't want to see a bomb. It was exploding like you hear about a bomb. The next I remember was when I woke up and I was about 50 or 60 yards from the aircraft still in my seat. Harry Gregg kept walking back into the back into the aircraft. I was afraid of what I would find. I was basically afraid of what I would find. Eventually found a child, got outside and shouted to the people in the distance, there's people alive in here. Snow was melting and I found Jackie. Jackie was crying. Roger Byrne, the captain, was lying across Jackie's waist. I just grabbed him by the waistbands and pulled him away from where it was sparking. I just couldn't believe it, the numbers of players that were, and then players that were my friends. I'd, I trained with them every day. So we were all preparing to go home, and then uh, the news flash came in, Manchester United plane involved in crash. I shall never forget the, the, the atmosphere and the, the, the sort of the shock and the, the, the stunned nature of it as, as the story unfolded and it became more and more serious. It was our Kennedy moment, really, you know, in that we all knew, you know, where we were at that moment. Every time the phone went, it was someone had passed, had died. A policeman came and told us that he was dead. The news started to filter through bit by bit, that there were some survivors. Busby had survived, but he was in intensive care. And of course, he had the last rites twice. I put my head in the oxygen tent and I started saying, Dad, you mustn't die, you mustn't die. When my dad did come round fully conscious, he said to me, Mother, I'm going to go through the players. Nod your head if they're still alive. And shake your head if... Uh, if they been killed, died. Tommy Taylor, David Pegg, Randy Coleman, Mark Jones, Billy Whelan, Sam Bent, all. Uh, tragic loss, tragic loss for them. Me and Eddie were always in the same football and cricket teams. He, he was my best friend and it was sort of designated to me to make a phone call to United offices where Les Olive was manning the phones. He said, well, where are you now then? I said, well, I've been with Mr and Mrs Coleman and phoning on their behalf. He said, well, do you feel able that you could pass the news on that Eddie's gone? I then had a cry, and I went back to Nine Archie Street, just pushed the door open, and everybody looks up at me expectantly. And I saw Marjorie's girlfriend's eyes really piercing through me, and I just said, he's gone. He was getting engaged to be married, and he wanted me to be his best man. Instead, Steve carried Eddie Coleman's coffin. 
one of the worst things to cope with after that was the bodies being flown home to Manchester and the cortege travelling from Manchester Airport to Old Trafford. I could be moved to tears at any time. I can now. I have those same feelings now of this incredible shock that such a thing could possibly have happened. They laughed, they loved, they played the game together. Played the game and gave it every ounce of life. And the crowds they thronged to see such free young spirits. My good God, there wasn't many going home. The die was cast for some of the last, the final challenge. On a snowbound ground on far off Serbia. The game was won, the song for sung, we sung all night together. My good God, there won't be many going home. They were gone. And uh, you, you wonder, why, why was it me? Why, why was it uh, not any of the others, you know? I would think that most people would feel guilty. I felt at the time, why did I take the club into Europe? Why would you go on the plane? My first reaction was, Never to have anything to do with football again. I remember my first reaction was never to have anything to do with football again. My wife went again, come along <clears throat> one of these days and said, uh, if these boys had the say that it's passed on, they would want you to carry on. As Matt Busby recovered, carrying on was left to his assistant, Jimmy Murphy. Manchester United remained in all competitions and played in the FA Cup 13 days after the crash. Gradually, Jimmy Murphy uh, knocked them into, uh, into shape and their first game against Sheffield Wednesday in the Cup it was a very emotional affair. I think people had just gone to Old Trafford to be part of it. They didn't have a ticket, but th they felt they had to go to Old Trafford in some way to to share in this recovery. There was very, very little atmosphere going down to the ground, but then when you got into the ground, it was electric. It was electric, the atmosphere. The poignancy of that first match for United was that when the programme came out, it showed the Sheffield Wednesday team all set out in the normal way, but for Manchester United, it just had the numbers with just a little line of dots underneath. Uh, because they had no idea until the last moment who was going to be playing. There was this sort of buzz and people began to talk to their neighbours, trying to take it all in. And when... I still feel it now. When the teams came out, Bill Folks, Bill Folks led them out, because he was made captain and he'd survived. Well, the roar... The roar was just unbelievable. People said afterwards you could hear the roar in Altrigham. The team that I felt sorry for that night was Sheffield Wednesday. Because, um, I'm quite honestly, they didn't have a chance. And the 60,000 crowd at Old Trafford, who came prepared to make all the allowances in the world, can hardly believe their eyes. Scratch team or no, this is straight out of the Busby Mole. And make no mistake about it, Sheffield are fighting as hard as they know how. Brennan takes a corner, and it's in! Pearson shot rebounds, but Seamus Brennan's there to land a beauty. 20-year-old Brennan was only included a few hours before the match, his first big game ever, and he scored two goals. No wonder the crowd cheer themselves hoarse. 17-year-old Mark Pearson has the ball. Alec Dawson's ready to receive, and there's number three. Without a shadow of a doubt, Sheffield Wednesday was swept away on a tide of emotion. But just as the smiles began to return, Munich struck its final blow. We had decorators in from the club, and I couldn't find the papers one morning. And it was after we had played Sheffield Wednesday. And I found out why I couldn't find the papers, it was because Duncan had died. People were thinking, oh, if only Duncan, of all, can live. But he never made it, he was too badly injured. 
Well, my father, he went to Munich to uh, speak to the survivors, obviously. Uh, it must have been harrowing for him to see. He got there and Duncan turned his head and looked at Jimmy Murphy and said, what time's the kick off? And Jimmy said, three o'clock, son, three o'clock. He was crying. I thought I would see Duncan again when I left that hospital, and that set me back a lot. United's team of reserves, borrowed men, emergency sign-ins and Munich survivors couldn't challenge for the league or European crowns. But by May, Matt Busby was back at Old Trafford and Jimmy Murphy had taken his team to the FA Cup final. I managed to get tickets to go and watch those games. And it was incredible, really. It was incredible further. Everybody everywhere, because of what had happened, felt United deserved to win uh, the Cup to help make up for, for the loss. And the, the whole nation was urging this team on, you know, that had been thrown together. Bolton were too strong for United that day, but Busby and Murphy ensured all that was to change. Dennis Law was bought, George Best was discovered. Gibbons on his right, Best again. A glorious goal by Best, what a magnificent goal by Best! and Bobby Charlton became the club's third European footballer of the year inside a decade. Ten years after Munich, United were back among the cream of the continent. Survivor Bill Folk scored in the semi-final as United pushed past Real Madrid. That was the only thing that we thought about. It, it took over from, from, the, from the Premiership, or the, the first division as it was then. Europe took over. It was a special destiny and responsibility to try their utmost to make their mark in Europe and become champions in respect for those who'd fallen on the way. They were in the final at Wembley. What Busby had dreamt, his new team could now realise. Ninety minutes now to play for the supreme prize in club football. And we were so close again to maybe losing that when Eusebio broke through just before the end and Alex Stepney came out and blocked his shot and Eusebio patted him on the head and Stepney waved him away and said, let's get on with it. Well, of course, it went to extra time, didn't it? That night at Wembley, it was a time of glory. It was all. It was a night of achievement. Munich, which made it very, very emotional. And meeting people after the game, it was, it was very, very difficult because you were thinking to yourself, well, if, if these people had been alive, I wouldn't have been here. There were other people on board our aircraft. The crew were on it. Diplomat Peron and relatives, there was a man called Willie Satinoff who was paying his own way. Two coaches, Tom Curry and Bert Wally, and the secretary, Walter Crickman, uh, Donny Davis, who used to write in The Guardian as Old International. Tom Jackson was a very popular uh, member of the Manchester Evening News staff, George Follows, Archie Ledbrook, Alf Clark, and uh, Eric Thompson, Henry Rose from the Daily Express was a, a larger-than-life character. Former player, Frank Swift, England goalkeeper, Manchester City goalkeeper, and one of their most famous players. So, Manchester City have got a very much a personal interest because they, they, they lost one of theirs. Swift had been an FA Cup winner with United's neighbours, alongside a certain Matt Busby. Now, 50 years on from Munich, the fixture list has given City fans their opportunity to pay tribute too. United's first match after the anniversary is the Manchester derby at Old Trafford. When it comes 6th of February, 50 years on, it's going to be a, quite an emotional day around about this place, felt by everyone. United will honour the dead with the creation of the Munich Tunnel at Old Trafford. The players will wear 1950s-style kit against City, in memory of the babes. Fans, old and young, are making the pilgrimage to Munich.
They went on to Emberley. We beat Benfica by four goals to one all those years ago. To me, it's it's important for me to be in Munich on the 50th anniversary of the disaster. Well, I'm only 15, so like, I learnt off my granddad and my nana all about, and that's all they would talk about. It's about Duncan Edwards and all that. And you see how much it means to people. You want to be a part of it when you're a rep. You can't fail to want to get a knowledge of the, the Man United history. And when you're walking around the ground, um, it's within the walls at Old Trafford. And to be able to call yourself one of them or be a part of one of them is a great, something great that you aspire to be part of. You know, 50 years on which of, of, from a disaster like what happened, it, it deserves to be remembered in a, in a special way. And there's, there's one thing for certain, this, this club will do it the right way. Oh, England's finest football team, a record truly great. A proud success is mocking by a career well to us the fate. Eight men will never play again, who mad destruction there. Oh, the pride of English football, the flowers of Manchester. There are those gone down that long, long road before us. Yet each morning we try and keep them in our sight. In memory's eye, the Busby babes are all immortal. The red devil spirit lives, it never died. Now the day of... Okay. Even more cold-blooded animals uh, in a few minutes when I introduce you to my new friend here. Ooh. Hi, yes, hello. Good, yeah. Uh, but first, it's back to High School Musical. It's the day before the show, and things are heating up Ooh, on the ice. Andy and I had been challenged to skate in High School Musical, the ice tour. But would we both be able to keep our cool and our balance in front of a live audience? Right, it's day two of my skating practice, and um, basically, I've come all the way to Sheffield to do it and I seem to have left my skating boots back in London. I'm just not very happy with him at the moment. We've lost an hour of precious skating time and he needs all the practice that he can get to, to be in this show. Only one thing for it, skating in my socks. Hey Andy, Jackie rustled up an emergency pair of skates and it wasn't the only surprise she had up her sleeve. I'm going to make both of you do a little trick oh. um, so that you get a little starring moment in the show. Oh my gosh, Ooh. I feel seasick watching that. Andy, this is going to be your move and there's a lot of faith I'm putting you in to be able to do this move because you're going to be in charge of holding a girl up. OK. OK? Oh, nice. I guess it's about being steady then, really. Absolutely. The We're just going to start with your feet wide apart, but you want them nice and parallel. Right. A little bit of bend in the knee. Yep. Left, right, and... Good. <laughs> that was really good. I really enjoyed that. Looks Four, easy, Andy. Okay. I've always had a phobia about Five, doing rules and was four, dreading my three, trick. Two, one. Forward comes oh, up. No, oh, I thought you were going to do it. I thought you were the thing is, once you take off, there's no way we're going to drop you. Right. right. Two, one. Forward comes up. Oh, no, I oh, can't. No, you're I nearly there. I knew you were there. I knew you were there. I knew you I know. Once that leg takes off, we just go, boom. Don't panic. You can do this. They've got you. You're not going to hurt yourself. So, Nick, go to it. There you go. There you do. That's the first one out of the way. I was so slow though. No, but that's like... fine. And your head was like this far off the ice. But could I do it on the ice? There you go. Excellent. That's, uh, that's great. great. You've done job. that all by yourself. So now can I be sharp? <laughs> I can't believe that I'm able to do that. I know I've still got a bit of work to do in getting the legs straight and doing it absolutely perfectly, technically Go. wise, but it's Yay. a bit of an achievement, especially on ice. So I'm very excited about doing it in the show. Come on, guys! Time to meet the rest of the cast. <laughs> Look at them. Amazing. Such talent. And then there's Andy and I. Enjoying 
just three hours' time, we'd be performing our routine in front of 12,000 people. I don't know about you, Zoe, but I was getting itchy feet. Andy, you're piercing the rim. I've just been out there to see the crowd, and uh, they're very loud. Welcome to High School Musical, The Ice Tour! Andy and I would be performing our routine in the second half. Oh. She's here. Yes. Quick, you better get them on. Yes. OK? Thank you, Shirley. This is what you have to wear under your costume. Nice. I think it's a receipt flash colour. It should be darker. Let's get to it. show the world. All right, Wildcats. Let me hear you make some noise. Here goes. I was up the ramp, but where was Andy? Here I come. Look out, Zoe. Time for my big moment. But I went too early and my head just missed the ice. I felt quite shaken, but I had to get on with the routine. And Ryan! Could I pull off my move? Effortless. Nice one, Akin Mulary. Zoe was brilliant and Andy was cool. It was really good and I liked Zoe dancing. absolutely amazing. I'd never be able to do anything like that. We'd so. pulled off our tricks. Now we could really enjoy the final chorus. Right. Woo. I feel in my heart. Oh, yeah, High School Musical rocks. That was brilliant. Now, from that challenge to another bigger one we're going to be taking on. Check this out. If you get things wrong, you could die. Four peaks. Three presenters. <laughs> Two shows. One goal. To get to the top. The mountains are not a game. You've got to get real. Blue Peter is gearing up for Sport Relief 2008. Get in training now. Look at it! I thought I'd... Oh, look, I've done it wrong! Tell you what, that looks tough. But as ever, we're going to need your help. And if you want to get involved, all the details are on the website. Get. Earlier on, I introduced you to Matilda. She is a shingle back skink. Now, James, skink live in, in quite strange places, don't they? So how would you capture them on film? Well, this one was quite easy to film, but some of them live in funny places like Dan Burrows. We've got a toy for doing that. And, Which is this? Um, that's right. It's a probe scope, and you've got a lens and a light on the end there, and it takes the image back into this piece of kit here. And anyone who's played a computer game can operate it, because it's got a little joystick, and as you wiggle it around, it wiggles around like a snake. That is cool. It's hard to believe there's a camera in there. Does, does the light affect the animals? No, it's a, it's a cold light. It's a fibre optic light, so it's, it doesn't... No, it doesn't hurt them, it doesn't affect Okay, let's have a look at uh, Matilda through this amazing bit of equipment. Uh, you can see, so if you were down a burrow or underground, you could see everything quite clearly. And uh, thanks to a camera like this, you're able to capture some amazing footage, footage like this. That is a close-up of the Hanan Dog's head. And there, just beside her head, is <laughs> a tiny little head of a baby. That's one. And if we push past her, there's a baleful look of mum, who doesn't appreciate this. And beyond, two. Two more babies. So that's three. Quite a crowded little home. So there they are, a nice little lizard family. 
some amazing footage underground here. And if you'd like to see life in cold blood, you can. 6 p.m. every Sunday evening on BBC One. And if you'd like some more facts about these fantastic animals, log on to the Blue Peter website. Yeah, for sure. And now time for some important news because... You're not going to sing it, are you? No, no, I'll be good. fine. <laughs> As of next week, Blue Peter will be on the change time of 4.35. If you're watching on BBC One, don't forget, it's on the change time of 4.35. I've just been weed on. I can't believe it. Again? It's been so good all day. Again? We'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Next time on Blue Peter, we celebrate the Chinese New Year of the rat with rats in the studio. I try my hand at formation flying. My hand is so wet now. It smells wet. And check out the website for all the behind the scenes action on my ice skating blog. What time is it next week? 4.35. Don't miss it. See you soon. Yeah. 4.35. Calling all Blue Peter fans. From next week, you can see Zoe, Andy and Geffen, same day, same place at the earlier time of 4.35. This week's mission has been released online. See if you have what it takes to be an MI High agent. Go to bbc.co.uk slash cbbc and click on MI High. Get there in time. your midweek news round and here are Wednesday's headlines. I'm at Wembley ahead of Fabio Capello's first match in charge of England. And the gates of Grange Hill will soon close for good after 30 years on the telly. First up, most of the home nations are in footy friendlies tonight, but it's a particularly big evening for England. All eyes are on Wembley and this man, Fabio Capello. It's his first game in charge. But can he turn the team around? Well, Helen is there waiting to find out. Helen. The last time the national side ran out here at Wembley, it turned into a disastrous night for English football. They were beaten and with it they failed to make it to Euro 2008. But that was last year. That's behind us now and England have a brand new manager. Tonight it's Fabio Capello's first match in charge. They play Switzerland. He's caused a bit of a stir by leaving some big names out of his squad. Apparently Owen will just sit on the bench. And he's not going to let on to the players exactly who's playing until the last minute. Sound harsh to you? Well, that's the way it's going to be under Fabio Capello. All right, you can question my footballing skills, but it seems you can't argue with the New England manager. The squad trained with their new coach for the first time this week and from the start he's made it clear who's the boss. According to the England players, Capello is so strict it's like being back at school. Shh. He wants the players to respect him and each other, so he's only calling them by their surnames. He wants everybody to be on time and everyone has to dress smartly. And another thing, Capello says all the England players have to eat together and nobody leaves until the main man's finished. Where are you going? All these rules are meant to help the players focus and improve their game. The idea is that this strict approach will turn England's footy fortunes around. I think um, some of the rules are pretty good because if you don't have rules in football, you know, you'll be able to play it properly. I think the new rules will be good because not using your mobile phone will make you keep your eye on the ball. And don't forget there's pressure on the manager himself. This is his first match in charge of a national side. You can see how he gets on from eight. Three other international matches taking place tonight. The Republic of Ireland play Brazil. Northern Ireland play... Bulgaria and almost forgot there and Wales take on Norway. 
Thanks, Helen. She's got a lot to remember. Now to America, where the battle is really hotting up to find out who will face each other in the competition to be the country's next president. Millions of votes are being counted to narrow it down to two final contestants. And Laura is live in the US capital, Washington, right now. Hello, Laura. Hello, Ellie. Well, yes, as you say, yesterday was all about millions of Americans voting to choose who they want to be in the finals of the competition to become the next president. And I had hoped to be able to stand here today and tell you who those finalists are going to be. But voting was a lot closer and a lot more exciting than anybody thought. So we still don't have the answer for you. But where are we at the moment? Well, if you imagine that this competition is a bit like an American wrestling competition, in the red Republican ring, the main contenders are John McCain, Mitt Romney and Mike Huckabee. Now McCain has won the most votes, but his main opponent Romney is trying to fight back. He's a long way behind though. Huckabee is doing better than expected, but it's very unlikely that either of them are going to catch McCain, who's almost certain to win. Now in the blue Democratic ring are Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Now this one is a lot closer. Clinton is slightly ahead, but Obama did well too last night, and so both candidates are still wrestling it out. So what happens next? Well, over the next few weeks, millions more Americans are going to be voting to choose who they want the finalists to be. And we expect to have an answer for you on that probably sometime this month or maybe next month. And that's when the really big fight starts to see who's actually going to be picked to be president on November 4th. From Washington, back to you in the studio, Ali. Exciting stuff. Thanks, Laura. Staying in America, voting's been difficult in some areas because of very wild weather. Violent tornadoes across four southern states have killed at least 45 people, including a child. It's midwinter in America, like here, and tornadoes at this time of year are rare. So these violent storms are all the more shocking. This is Arkansas, where people have died and many more have been injured. An 11-year-old child and her parents were killed when their home in the town of Atkins was destroyed by the twisting wind. In neighboring Tennessee, the destruction was also frightening. Trucks overturned, trapping people inside, and buildings were smashed to pieces. A shopping center was hit head-on. We were just standing there, the lights were out, everyone started yelling, come running inside, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, we fell on the ground, uh, you can see cars backing up real fast. All of a sudden it started shaking, the air started moving, everything started falling. Uh, about 10 seconds, it was just chaos, it was so quiet. The twisters also caused a big explosion at a gas plant, which killed at least one person and injured several others. Devastating weather is something America is used to, but for those affected, this is a nightmare. And finally, the most famous school on TV is to close. Grange Hill has been on telly for 30 years, but the new series to be shown later this year will be the last. Here's Lizzo. It's the world's longest-running children's television drama series. Grange Hill first hit TV screens in 1978, and down through the years, it's never been afraid to tackle hard-hitting subjects. But it's not just been about issues like bullying or racism or drugs. Fun characters and exciting storylines have made it one of the most popular children's programmes, and lots of you won't be happy that there'll be no more episodes after the end of the next series. So why is it goodbye? It's been going now for 31 series and I think it's time to say goodbye to it just because we want to do other new things and we feel that children do other things apart from go to school and we wanted to explore areas in children's lives that happened outside the school arena. You might not be the only one sad to see Grange Hill go. It's been on our screens for nearly 30 years and your mum and dad probably watched it when they were your age. This is what it looked like then. Don't let me ever catch you doing that again, understand? Back then it wasn't just a TV series, it also had a big impact in the real world. An anti-drugs campaign led to a top five single in the charts. The new series starts later this year and after that Grange Hill will be shutting its school gates forever. And that's it from us, see you later. 
Agents, you've got 20 seconds to stop MP Mary Taylor. The schools of this country are in crisis. The entire MI High operation is at stake. An epidemic of unruly behavior. She wants them locked up. The new series of MI High. Get there for the new time. Monday at 4.35 CBBC on BBC One. mile. Sign up for your nearest mile online or call 0845 605 8000. <laughs> Tonight on BBC One, the England team's first test with Fabio Capello at the helm. A friendly with Switzerland in Match of the Day Live from Wembley at 7.30. Now, they're concerned with the whereabouts of Declan. 